This is Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior and thinking. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to explore behavior through a behavioral science lens with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring those insights to you. We help you uncover behavioral tools and tactics that will help you lead a more fulfilling and gratitude-filled life. I see where you're going with that, Kurt. Very nice. But let's get to that later. First, I've got a little softball question for you. Okay, go ahead. Sure. What are you most grateful for? Oh, softball question. (laughs) (laughs) What am I most grateful for? A softball question is like, What's your favorite food? You know, uh, you know what's uh, what's your favorite color? No, you know, I thought oh that you All could right. start the day with a challenge. How about that? You know? <laughs> Why? Thank you. I'm I'm grateful that you're thinking of me about that. All right. All right. Most grateful for. Let me think. Um. All right. So this may sound cliche, right? But I think I'm most grateful for my family. I'm grateful that I met Aaron when I did in my life and that somehow she liked me and that we've shared our lives together since that moment with two wonderful kids joining the journey. And here's why I'm grateful because I think I would be a very different person without them. And I like who I am right now. I'm not perfect, but you know, that's okay. If I think about it, I probably would not have started my own company, at least not when I did, if I hadn't met Aaron I probably wouldn't have gotten my PhD without my family. I I don't even know if I would be here doing this podcast with you without them. Wow. I mean, there's lots of inflection points in life, but if I look back on the past 20 plus years, my family have been instrumental in pretty much all of those major inflection points. Wow. That's a fantastic answer. Let me ask you this, just to follow up, if you don't mind. Okay. Do you express... Your gratitude to them enough? Oh God, not not nearly enough, right? Maybe a little bit with my wife, but definitely not to my kids. I mean, I typically just complain to my kids. So, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, that's tough, right? But gratitude and our lack of it in most work and maybe even life situations is what our conversation with our guest Chester Elton is about in this episode. And Kurt, it appears that you're not alone in your rather dismal display of gratitude. (laughs) (laughs) Chester's work, along with his co-author, Adrian Gostick, suggests that most managers seriously undervalue and maybe more importantly, underuse gratitude with their employees. Chester is the author of over 15 books on recognition and workplace performance. He's a sought after speaker and executive coach, and he's originally from Canada. Actually, not sure why that's important, but Hey, it's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. All right. So, okay. So, Tim, is it weird that it feels good to know that I have a lot of company in being <laughs> bad about this? Social norm here, buddy. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, the conversation with Chester was wonderful. You can hear the joy in his voice and you get great insights from the wonderful stories that he weaves. And I think that Chester might have had more stories per minute than any guest that we've ever had. He is the consummate storyteller. It was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I'm very grateful that we had it. Yeah, I I, I am too. You know, I'm a big fan of of his and Adrian's work and have been for many years. Uh, So I, I just want to express my gratitude to them. I'm also grateful for all the people who are listening to the show, right? I We're aware that everyone who takes time to listen, they have limited time, right? And we want to express our thanks that you're sharing some of those valuable hours with us. We appreciate it. Yes, yes. And we are particularly grateful for those listeners who've shared this podcast with a friend or left us a review. That is how we achieve our goal of expanding the community of behavioral science enthusiasts. And we are super grateful to you. And we are even more grateful to those listeners who dig into their pockets and support us through a monthly donation to our Patreon site. It's so easy and we really appreciate it. Now, those contributions help offset the cost of producing this podcast, and we are really extremely grateful for that. So thank you. Yes, thank you. So now please sit back with a large mug of gratitude and enjoy our conversation with Chester Elton. 
Chester Elton, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thanks so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. It is a pleasure. It is super exciting to have you here. We're going to start with a speed round. So, Tim, first question. Coffee or tea? Uh, I don't drink coffee or tea. If I drink tea, it's herbal, herbal tea. So so what do you drink instead of coffee or tea? Is it water? Is it some, you know, high octane energy drink? What is it? <laughs> you know, I do. I drink a little, a lot of water. I drink Gatorade. The reason I don't drink coffee or tea is because I'm a devout Mormon and we don't drink oh. coffee, tea or alcohol. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So that'll make more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's terrific. Okay. All right. So if you could have dinner with your favorite sports star actress or musician which would you pick roger federer Ooh, okay oh, yeah. So, yeah 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 now why why roger why roger over everybody else well i grew up in a tennis family so we play in fact i'm playing tennis tomorrow you know you uh, doubles at my age you know so you don't have to run that much i just think he's just such a class act you know yeah. and the thing i love about roger federer is even though he's not number one anymore he continues to play because he loves the game yeah. You know, yeah. and, and the, my, my next uh, on the list would be Rod Laver. You know, he's still kicking. Oh, and wow. as a kid, yeah. uh, Rocket Rod Laver, I, I love the Aussies for the same reason. You know, they, <laughs> they, they love the game. You yeah. know, it was all about the, no one player was above the game. They love the game. And when you love to play, you play. What all are you right. saying about John McEnroe? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a, it's kind of a kind of an unspoken like, yeah. All right. No. Okay. Well, I thought for sure you would have gone uh, like hockey, somebody hockey, but all right. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing, you know, often you say you, you don't want to meet your heroes because they'll disappoint you, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I love hockey and I grew up with hockey and, you know, Bobby Orr would probably be at the top of the list there. He was the, the great, uh, the, yep. the Boston Bruins and so on. The thing is, is um, I've had friends that have met their hockey heroes and they said, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't kind of what you thought. <laughs> I, get it. I, I think I think I tennis it. might be better uh, sport for that. All right. So does homemade maple syrup taste better than store-bought maple syrup? Uh, you know, I've only been able to have like two drops of homemade <laughs> <laughs> maple syrup. This is a story we talked about before the back. We went and tapped all these trees for like four days and got about as much syrup to make like literally, I'm I'm guessing it was maybe a tablespoon. <laughs> and, and not a tablespoon way, per person just entirely one tablespoon exactly and we had to split that tablespoon among four people <laughs> so, so yes it it tasted um great <laughs> all right final speed round question and our speed round questions always seem to not be speed rounds anymore anyway so does joy make us grateful or does being grateful bring us joy? It's it's the latter. It's the gratitude brings you joy. And, you know, it's not the chicken and the egg. And for people that you've met, that you like to be around, that are just naturally grounded in joy, you will find every time they are grateful by nature. Yeah. I think there's some real interesting concepts around that. And you... Uh, and your co-author, just well, your book was released last year, which is Leading with Gratitude. Fantastic. Um, so tell, tell our listeners a little bit about that book, and then let's talk a little bit about gratitude to be start. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, it's so funny. We just finished our 14th book, uh, Anxiety at Work, and we'll probably we'll get a chance to talk about that at the end. But 14 books, we never thought, I mean, we sort of had this idea that we might write a lot of books. Uh, 14 to me seems like a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. And um, we wrote a series of books uh, with carrot in the name, yep. you know, uh, managing with carrots, you know, the 24 carrot manager, a carrot a day, you know, the invisible employee, how carrots brings out the best in people and, and on and on. And it was all about recognition. We were working for a recognition company at the time. And we loved that. You know, it was the ceremony. It was the ritual, the tradition, how do you present it, it the multiple moments of recognition and so on. And I think it's still very important. We, we then went on to take a deep dive in, into culture and teamwork and leadership. And we always found this thread of gratitude that ran through it. Mm. And so when it, we kind of wanted to refresh the carrot principle and, uh, you know, we thought we will call it the carrot principle 2.0 or whatever, you know, to get a little clever. We came to the realization, though, particularly uh, in our executive coaching, that recognition is one thing. Gratitude is another. Mm. Gratitude is a little more of the emotional connection. It's the day-to-day -day 
you know, it's how you really deeply emotionally connect with people and, and occasions and things. And so for, for me, it was very, not to, to be too punny here, it was very gratifying mm. to uh, take a deep dive into gratitude because we found not only was it a great way to lead and did we, we were able to interview some just phenomenal leaders uh, that led their organizations with gratitude to extraordinary success. It was also just the best, the better way to live. It was mm. just a better way to live your life. And I'll tell you what was great was every leader we interviewed practiced gratitude deeply at home. And that was very affirming to us. Which goes to the part, which is, you know, if you live your life with gratitude, that will bring you you joy as opposed to the opposite way around there. So tell us a little bit about why gratitude is so important. And you also talked about a gratitude gap in in organizations. Tell, uh, explain that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, we've got a database of over a million engagement surveys. We have our own motivators assessment. We had like 90,000 people take that. And so as you start digging into that, we've had some fun surveys where we, we've asked managers, do you think you're above average in expressions of gratitude and, and recognition? I think like 70% said, oh yeah, listen, I, I, I rock this, you know? Wow. Yeah. I'm o- the- overconfidence bias, huh? Right. Yeah. I, I am, uh, you know, <laughs> so what was it? Michael Scott said, uh, do you want people to love you or be afraid of you? And he says, I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like me. Well, then, of course, the flip side is you ask their direct reports. Do you think your manager is above average? And only 23% agreed. And so there's this, uh, this, yeah. this gap. And, and so often as we coach executives and we look at culture and so on, they'll say, uh, well, I think I might be doing gratitude a little too much. And I'll say, you know what? When you get to that point you're probably doing it about right. And say, really, mm-hmm. can, can you overdo it? And then one of my favorite little you know, quizzes is, say, well, ask yourself, how many times in your career did you ever, at the end of the day, go home to your family and say, I couldn't get anything done today? I mean, seriously, every time I turned around, there was a cake, there were balloons, there was a plaque, they were giving <laughs> me a watch. You know, I, uh, you know you could, Gallup did a wonderful study. You know, I think it was how full is my bucket. And they said, how... In the workplace, you know, how many expressions of gratitude becomes too much? And they said you max out at 13 times a day. So, I mean, you go back and say, how many times did that ever happen? And by the way, so on number 14, it starts to tail off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, you know. Yeah, this reminds me of a story you told that captured in, in a YouTube video that I just loved where you engage somebody in a husband talking about how much he loved his wife. You know, how often do you tell her? And you say, well, wouldn't it just be better to just save it for once a year and make a really big <laughs> deal out of it? <laughs> I just laughed. I just absolutely laughed out, out loud at that. So, but you, we could give, we could be showing our gratitude up to 14 times a day without any detrimental effects. Right. Now, you know, they do qualify it, right? Because you say, look, one, one of our favorite expressions is general price has no impact. And whether it's in the workplace or, or with your kids, right? Say, oh, that's great. Hey, you're the best. Hey, you're the you're the Tower of Pisa. You know, you get your finger guns out there, you know. <laughs> and 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 that, that gets very old very quickly. And I had a great we, we we so we, you know, Adrian Gostick, my co-author, who's the brilliant writer, by the way, you know, you say, Oh, you've got all these co-authors. Yeah, there's there's one person writing the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and with us, it's Adrian. And uh, trust me, like I go to high school reunions, they go, you wrote uh, New York Times bestselling books? I said, well, I have a writing partner. They go, oh, oh, yeah, okay. Then, no. <laughs> <laughs> now we understand. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. we get it. Yeah, yeah. We, and, we were con- yeah, and it's kind of like, hey, good for you. Because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, read, I read some of your essays. There's no way it was you. Anyway, um, uh, and, and so it's really interesting. So we, we experiment on our kids with all this stuff, right? <laughs> you know, so Fantastic. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we're getting all this general praise stuff. And, and, and we're telling leaders, you know, you got to be, you know, in, in leading with gratitude, it was uh, do it often, uh, you know, and don't be afraid. You know, do it now, do it often, don't be afraid. Uh, one of the things we, we talk a lot about is be specific. You know, general praise has no has no impact. So, you know, and you, we do this as parents all the time. We, we've got four kids and they're the classic, you know, they come home from school and they got the finger painting thing or the whatever it is. And you go, oh, aren't you just the best little artist? Oh, aren't mm. you just clever? They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my son, Brendan, who, by the way, now is an engineer. So just to give you some context, 
he'd bring these home and I, oh, aren't you clever? Aren't you? Oh, let's put that up in the fridge. He'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'd almost just start tossing them to us because, you know, so then we said, well, let's get more specific. So he brings this thing home and I said, oh, Brandon, that's really great. He goes, yeah, yeah, aren't I, aren't I just the most clever little artist? You know, he's, he's, <laughs> he's like six years old. He's giving me attitude, you know. Anyway, so uh, I said, well, well, tell me a little bit about what's going on here. Said, oh, oh, well, yeah, see, these, this is like the earth, you know, and then these are like the aliens. And I go, oh, what's this? The, the, oh, that's the black sky. You know, there's a storm coming in. And I go, oh, what's all the red here? Well, that's the river of blood from the aliens killing all the... <laughs> so, you know, we got him a counselor. <laughs> the, 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 the point is, is that he was so much more engaged when we just asked a few questions. Well, tell me about this. Well, tell me, oh, I like the way you use the colors here. And it's the same in the workplace, right? Hey, you know, thanks for taking care of that customer. That's great. Thanks for taking care of that customer. When they walked in, man, they were upset. And you were able to just calm them down, walk them through. It was covered under the warranty. They walked in looking for a fight and they skipped out a customer forever. That's what we talk about when we talk about customer service. It's a whole different context. And by the way, it takes what, like a minute or yeah. two more? So, yeah. you know, we, we joke about you can't get it too much. You can get it too much if it's done badly. Mm. And, and you know, and, and the same thing, you know, the YouTube video, how many times you tell your wife you love her, you know? Well, yeah. there's I love you and there's I love you. Now, if you've been, you know, we're going to celebrate 38 years, you know, this August. And wow. we, we've got the banter down and we know that we love each other. And, and it's other expressions, you know, like when my wife comes down and the kitchen's all cleaned up. Yeah. She's like, oh, you really do love me. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah I, I really Is do. Is that the once a year kind of thing that, that you do that big, like, oh, I clean the kitchen. This year. Yeah, I do it on her birthday. Every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I hope you make a big deal out of it too. Oh yeah. Oh, and I point out, I said, you know, down here in the corner it was really dirty, and you'll see it's clean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we we, we joke and, and and yet in the workplace, those little things make all the difference. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'll tell you a great story. We 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 used it as the opening story in our book, uh, The Best Team Wins. We got to met uh, Chris um, Chris Hatfield, and he was the commander of the International Space Station. And a fabulous story because he's Canadian. So Adrian and I were just geeking out, you know, that the, he's commander of the international, the Canadian astronaut. And I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Canada has astronauts. Yes, we've had three. Okay, we've had three. And, and, and Chris is the most famous. In fact, he's on the back of the Canadian $5 bill. Oh, oh my God. Wow. There you go. So cool. Now, they don't say it's him. It doesn't say Chris Hatfield, but it, it's him spacewalking in the, the Canadian flag on his suit. And we always joke that it's it's really a big deal because he replaced hockey players. <laughs> if, yeah, if you're going to bump hockey players off Canadian money, you better be a big freaking deal, you know? Yes. <laughs> anyway, the story of their group was amazing. You know, three cosmonauts, two American astronauts, and of course, the Canadian in the middle. And they trained for a decade to go up. And they're really smart guys and they learned all the rules and, you know, the movies that, oh, well, you know, we'll just grab a couple of guys, give them two weeks in training, we'll shoot them up yeah. on a rocket. Never happens, right? And he said, you know, we don't envision success, which I thought was really interesting. He says, we envision failure because if there's a breakdown in the, in the space station and we can't fix it, you know, we, we might all die. So it's really important for us to know how do we deal with things that go wrong? Well, they're, they're up there for five months. And by the way, the International Space Station is small. Like it is not a big place. So you get five grown men or six grown men in this confined space. It was one of the most productive uh, NASA, if not the most productive over five months. So they did the, you know, the aftermath. How did you do it? He said, you know, we obeyed all the rules. We were really smart. He says, we did a couple of other things. We got to know each other's families or their hobbies. He actually taught himself uh, to speak fluent Russian. Mm. So, you know, what that meant to the cosmonauts. I mean, you know, we're, we're so English centric, you know, the, the world should speak English, which I, I think, by the way, is true. Uh, and yet, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. what's well, the old joke? If you speak more than two languages, you're multilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak one language, you're an American. Yep, that's yeah. it. Yep, that's yeah. it. It's an old yeah. joke. And yet we like it. So anyway, he said, what made all the difference was the one unwritten rule we had. And this is such a good lesson for uh, business people in your families, he said, every astronaut was required to perform one random act of kindness for every other astronaut every day. Wow. That was my reaction too, Tim. I thought, that is brilliant. It is. 
Now there wasn't a chart, you know, you didn't put a little sticker <laughs> and it was never anything big. And, and this is the point of leading with gratitude, right? They don't have to be big things. It was like, you know what? I'll cook dinner or let me clean the equipment or I'll take the watch or do you need some help with those calculations? Little random cleaning the kitchen for your wife. Mm-hmm. And he said, because of that, and this was so interesting. He said, because we did that, we never had a heated argument. No one ever lost their temper because he says, you see, with these random acts of kindness, the message is, I care about you. You're on my team. I'm cheering for you. I've got your back. I love you. And see, when you've got that kind of emotional connection, you don't take offense. My dad, you know, my greatest mentor, John Dalton Elton Dalt, you know, he'd say, you have to choose to be offended. Hmm. You have to, hmm. and, and, and I'll give you the perfect story on that. My dad was a bigger than life character for me and my four older brothers. So in our church, it's a volunteer uh, ministry. You know, you get called to teach Sunday school and so on. And he was working with the youth programs. And of course, every congregation has got that miserable curmudgeon that just, you know. <laughs> no. They, I, I know you find it hard to believe, Tim. It, they, they are out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we had one, you know, this older lady, and she, you know, wanted to invite us into her misery. And she comes up to my dad. My brother Byron told me this story. She comes up with my dad after church, and she says, Brother Elton, you think that all the youth in our congregation just love you. Well, I'm here to tell you they don't. <laughs> oh and, he, and he, I know, can you imagine? And he leans back with a big smile, and he says, well, thank you. And she says, it wasn't a compliment. And he said, <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, you got to wow. choose to be offended. And so what I love about the space station story is these little acts of kindness, these little things you do for each other when you build that team. You know, I, you talk about psychological safety. You know, the Harvard School of Business did that wonderful study on psychological safety. And yeah. and, and it, it creates that trust, that, that, that bond. That, and if you do have a misstep, you're, you're so quickly forgiven. Because they know there's no there's no malice. There, it, the there, the intent. They, 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 there's not the, the the malicious intent because you have shown them that you're really this this person who, as you said, caring, loving, all of those factors that are going into that. Yeah. So Chester, I want to. What's the difference in your opinion between gratitude and recognition? Is there a specific? Is is there? Are they distinct? Are they overlapping? What? is the the difference. Well, I think a lot of people use them interchangeably and I don't think there's any, you know, problem with that. Because we're authors, we parse everything out, right? So mm-hmm. I I honestly That's think okay. that the difference between recognition and gratitude is recognition is a little more ceremonial. Mm. It's a little more of the tradition, it's a mid, more of a ritual. You know, when when we wrote um, the, the carrot principle, we we talk about when you make a presentation, here are the elements of a great presentation and multiple moments of recognition, you know, you you get that gold watch, and every time you look at the watch, you remember the ceremony and the emotion that came with it. And obviously, with that, we did talk about you know handwritten notes and things like that. It tends to be a little more, I, to, to me, it's a little more of the ritual. It's a little more formal. There, and often, there was something tangible. Mm. There was a certificate. There was a plaque. There was a pin, something. Uh, leading with gratitude, to me, was more of how you build a culture of gratitude. And that's what happens every day. How do I interact? Dude, because of your actions, do I know that you care about me and I care about you? To what degree do you think uh, leaders make that or don't make that happen? Is, is is gratitude something that could bubble up from the bottom up? Or to what degree does it need to come from the top down? Well, you know, in, in Leading with Gratitude, we talked about the eight practices and we divided them up into seeing and then, you know, doing, right? And it was kind of interesting that the very last one on eight is make it peer to peer. So yeah, it can bubble up. You know, all the work that we've done on engagement over the last decade or, you know, 30 years, right? We've been, how do we get people more engaged? You know, and, 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 and engagement is on a, a steady decline. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we laughed that if we didn't focus on it, maybe it would have gotten better, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and this, this idea that we, we, we've kind of gone, we've got it upside down where we've put a lot of pressure on managers and supervisors. You're responsible for your employees' engagement. And yeah, I think you have input there. Honestly, I think you're responsible for your own engagement. Mm. I mean, if you aren't willing to take responsibility for that, you can have the, you know, you can have the greatest leader ever and may not make a difference. You've got to be open to that. And, 
you know, making it peer to peer, we've got a, a, a brilliant leader. He's become a good friend of ours over the years uh, up in Toronto. It is uh, Bill Manning. He is the president of Toronto FC, you know, the MLS team. In fact, we met him when he was the president of uh, Real Salt Lake down in Salt Lake City. Oh, okay. And uh, he goes up to Toronto and they've got these rabid fans, never had made the playoffs. I think the best they'd finished was like seventh or something. And Bill's got to go up and he's got to turn the culture around. And so one of the things he does is he's, he talks to everybody in the staff and says, tell me what you do and why you do it. They say, well, I'm the cook. You know, I cook the meals for the players and I do it so they'll be healthy and on and on and on. And so he pulls them all together. He says, you know, I, I talked to all of you. And when I asked you why you do it, I got 60 different answers. And he said, we've got to change that. There's only one right answer. I do what I do so that we can win the MLS Cup. That's it. Mm. So here's what he did that was beyond brilliant. He built a trophy case for the MLS Cup and put it right in the entrance to the practice facility. You know, And he said, I wanted everybody that came in every day to say, we're going to do everything we can today to put a cup in that trophy case. Well, you know, normally it takes a long time to turn around any kind of franchise, any kind of business, right? Yeah. It's funny because they said, uh, we're going to give you a, a two-year contract. He says, no, you're not. You're going to give me a five-year contract. This is going to take longer than you think. Anyway, in three years, they won the MLS Cup. In fact, year two, they played for the Cup. Yeah. And it was remarkable because what he did is he said, we made it peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, he got everybody visually to buy in. And here's what he would do. I forget whether he did this weekly or monthly, but at any rate, he'd bring the staff together and he would, you know, give out the plaudits and so on and praise people and so on. And then he would have a gift certificate to like a, a retailer or a restaurant or something. And it was actually a fair amount. I think it was a couple hundred dollars. And he would randomly pick somebody out of the staff and say, who do you want to recognize with this gift certificate? So it wasn't him because he, he realized that, you know, as the boss, he's not going to see everything that's going on. Right. And so he says, I knew we'd broken through and I'm, I'll make up the names. He said, you know, I, I called up Tom and I said, Tom, who do you want to recognize? And Tom calls out Scott and Scott comes up and everybody's cheering and, and applauding. And Scott grabs it and he says, I have been waiting six months for this because Susan in accounting kills it every week. So oh. Susan, come on, he gave away his award. And, and that's when he's building back and he goes, ah, we're onto something here. You know, uh, it is, it is absolutely brilliant though, because it's just, you mentioned like your, your friend can't see everything. And what he's doing is pushing, not pushing is the, that's the wrong term. He's allowing the members of the team. So he's not only recognizing the person who ultimately gets the gift certificate, but it is also the person who is giving it. And that just makes that even that much more memorable for those two people, plus everybody else, because they go, this is real. It's not, they're not sucking up to the boss, exactly. right? And this isn't, oh, they're her, his, his or her buddies. So they always are the ones who get this recognition time in and time again. That, I love that. It's, it's just beautiful. And so simple, right? I mean, he was going to give it out anyway. It's not going to cost him any more. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> so I want to go back to you said something really cool, which are sort of novel and maybe even revolutionary about where we are responsible for our own engagement, which I think is a really cool idea. But we also have data that there's some percentage, 20, 25 percent of people who are don't really care about recognition, don't want to be engaged, you know, prisoners of war, basically. What do you do about them? Yeah, you know, uh, back to Bill Manning, it's interesting that you bring that up. You know, when he took over, he says, you know, the 25, 50, 25 rule. And, you know, when you do all this research and stuff, I didn't want to admit that I didn't. So I said, uh, well, you know, uh, why don't you explain it to me, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> What's you know, your take on it? <laughs> yeah, I know what it means to me. I want to know what it means <laughs> what to you. To you. Yeah, yeah. So he says, Classic uh, consultant. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. so he says, well, you know, 25% of people are going to buy in right away. You know, you, you've got the title, they're, they're corporate people, and you're the president, you're the president. 50%, you've got to get them, you've got to win them over. And then he said, and then there's 25% that are never going to get it. And he said, your job is to give them a chance and then rotate them out. You know, I, I love, um, you know, good to great and all that, you know, get the bus, get the right people on the bus. What people don't talk about is get the wrong people off the bus. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, those are those are hard lessons, you know, because we all say, oh, you know, manage around that. You know, he's such a talented guy or she's got such great relationships with the clients. You know, if we let her go and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. It's misery. Yeah. It's absolute misery. 
if they're not going to buy in, if they don't walk into the practice facility and say, I'm putting a cup in that case, then they're not in the right place. And by the way, you're you're not doing yourself any favors and you're not doing them any favors because they don't fit anyway. They're, they, you know, they're miserable. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I love the, uh, the different ways, though, you, you do that. You know, you, you know, it's time. It's time, Kurt, for us to make you available to the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> Frame it in a way that is. Yeah, gentle and different things. And, and so. there's Kurt going, you know what? You're right. The marketplace yeah. needs me to be available. They yeah. need me now. <laughs> that's yeah. right. So, uh, so I love that. You know, and we do talk about, you know, there are some people that aren't going to get it, and that's fine. What kind of culture are you are you reading? Look, you know, I live just outside New York City. There, there is a mercenary culture in a lot of financial institutions. Yeah. Uh, I was talking just earlier today, we've got a leadership group that gets together for an hour every Friday and one of the brilliant young women in there is is a coach at a, a, one of the biggest law firms in New York. I said, how do you like your job? She goes, it's fascinating because here are all these Ivy League, just super smart, top of their class lawyers that come to this big law firm and they're making a gazillion dollars. And to a person, they are miserable. <gasps> to a person, wow. they are miserable. Wow. They have no life. This has been their dream job. They get there and they figure that, you know, and 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 by the way, I've had friends in New York that are lawyers and, you know, I mean, they're working 12, 14 hours a day. It's all billable hours. It's, are you going to make partner and on and on and on. And, and often, you know, 20, 30 years later, they stop and look back and go, you know, what's it all about? Why did, why did I do that? There's a, a whole body of research on self-identity and self-schemas. And a lot of that is through that self-talk that we have. So this, this idea of who we are is built upon this foundation of the words that we use and how we talk to ourselves in those moments we're reflecting back or looking forward about that. So I love this idea of making that inner voice your best friend, because when you think about that best friend, that best friend is, is to you said, it's, a, you know, I got your back. I'm going to support you. you you're going to do great on this. Whereas that inner critic that you we have, as you said, it's like, oh, I'm just keeping it real when when that doesn't really help us. I mean, there's a point it, we, we obviously ruminate about some of these things as, as part of this, you know, element to make it so that we can prepare, as you mentioned earlier, the the idea of preparing for the failure as opposed to the the envisioning the success in the in the space station, right? We need to be able to have some preparation for that. But when it starts to get rumination and you start to just, that's the only voice that you're hearing, that leads to, uh, as you said, anxiety and all these other factors. I, I love the idea because it's a simple hack. And sometimes simple hacks are the best. Well, and you know, it was so interesting and it was a bit of a revelation. This just happened a couple of days ago. And I thought, you know what? It's okay to borrow someone else's voice to be your best friend while you're working on that. You know, somebody said, I'm going to make you my inner voice. And I thought, you know what? I'm honored. Yeah. I'm honored you would want me to be your inner voice. Which you should be. Exactly. You should be. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. borrow, borrow, the, you know, it's borrowed credibility, you know, and, <laughs> and, and that's fine. And I think that's great. You know, it, it, it is so interesting that I think it is fascinating that our work led us from gratitude to anxiety because, I, you know, uh, you, you quoted Brene Brown at the beginning, you know, is it? Is it gratitude that makes us joyful or is it joy that makes us uh, grateful? And, you know, just those wonderful little sayings that that come. I, I, I put stuff up on my bulletin board here in my little home office, you know, to serve is to live by Francis Cecil Bain. One of my favorite quotes is counting our blessings is far better than recounting our problems. No matter our situation, showing gratitude for our privileges is a unique, fast acting and long lasting spiritual prescription. Yeah. I, I just love that. So I, I've been reading, you know, I know you guys love books. And have you read Jay Shetty's book, Think Like a Monk? No, no I have not. I've, no. I've, I've, I, it, I love Shetty, put, though, by the yeah, way. Yeah, put it yeah. on your list. By the way, he endorsed our book, uh, Anxiety at Work. Well, there you go. I am so geeked out about that. His, his, um, his book agent is our book agent. And he has this <laughs> thing about mantras. And uh, what's your mantra? And so I thought, what is my mantra? You know, that I can start the day, you know, my, that inner voice. Mm -hmm. And so when my feet touch the ground every morning, my mantra is be kind, be grateful, be of service. Oh, I love that. Nice. Nice. And channeling my dad, my dad used to say, you know, Chess, the only people you don't love are people you haven't served. Oh, man. How yeah. great is that? Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, Dalt Elton. Hey, he's he passed away some years ago. Trust me. If you had him on the show, it would be ten times better because he's just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's but, just amazing. but he's not, and you are, and we are having a fantastic time. And we need to ask you: Do you what's on your playlist these days? Do you have a COVID playlist? You know, it's so interesting. I, I downloaded the Calm app. And uh, they don't have like greatest hits. It's all like you know seagulls and which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, your voice is, which is <laughs> nice. No, your voice is absolutely saying no. That's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> well, you know it's okay if you're working and you want that in the back. You can't sing along. Is my point. You know. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. You know, uh, I am a big Bonnie Raitt fan. I mm. love her. You know, the gravelly voice. I've downloaded everything the Beatles ever recorded. You know, uh, we were having fun in one of our groups. They said, what is your walk-up song? You know, what would be your walk-up song? Yeah. And it's like, what, what, what's your wedding song? And, and I, I always laughed. That, and my wife didn't agree. I said, you know, when they, you know, and now Mr. and Mrs. Elton take the dance floor. And this will be their song now and forever. Right? <laughs> and I, Psycho Killer by Talking Heads. That would be, <laughs> no one would forget it, you know. Anyway, all kidding aside, my walk-up song is Happy by Pharrell. I just, you know, you can't listen to that. Happy, yeah. And uh, I, a cute story. I was looking for a, a, a Bluetooth speaker, you know, for, for my office. And I was at the Apple store. And this great young salesman. And he says, hey, I got to play this song for you because the bass is the highs and the lows. And he, he plays Happy and he starts kind of swaying. He says to him, he says to me, he says, you know, brother that song doesn't cheer you up i'm praying for you yeah <laughs> oh. yeah yeah exactly exactly he made me laugh and yeah i bought it so it's um it, it, you know i i just think that song you know there's clapping there's like the gospel music in the background it just yeah it's a happy song and, and i'll tell you i love that you ask people about what's on your playlist because have you eliminated songs off your playlist yeah there's songs I don't know if I've actually eliminated them, but I th there are playlists that I that come in and get there, and then there are playlists that kind of lose. But I don't I haven't actually curated them on yeah. the back end. I curate new ones yeah. that kind of replace the old ones. Yeah, you know it's kind of interesting. It's, it's back to you know you don't want to meet your heroes. I, I used to be a big uh, big fan of uh, Morrison, okay, you know? and you know Riders on the Storm and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. And then I saw a documentary on him and everything, and it's just such a tragic tale, you know. Of, <sighs> uh, you know, and 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 after knowing the story, and you know, he's just device. I thought I can't listen to those songs and not think about how sad that is. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I I I've started to delete them, which you know you say yeah, but you bought them, you know, even if you don't listen to them, there's value. And and I thought you know what, we should probably curate our 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 lists. Because stuff will pop up and you just skip over it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's declutter. And I think if you play that song and it doesn't have a positive impact or it doesn't make you think, it doesn't make you have to laugh or cry. If it doesn't make you think, then then why is it on your playlist? Yeah. Or if it, it to, to your point, right, you're, you're talking about curating the emotions that you're having with these. And so there are times when we need those sad songs, right? There are yeah. those times where they are actually rejuvenating and, and this yep. element of you, you, this catharsis of letting out of this from a sad song. But you don't want that sad song in the middle of your happy mix. You don't want the, oh my God, that's uh, Jim Morrison, man, what a tragic piece, even though I'm now skipping over it. You, you've just gone from being, you know, upbeat and positive to, uh, yeah, and then you got to get back up. That's not what you want. I, I like, like that. that. Yeah. And, and songs that make you think like, you know, I love Danny boy, my grandpa, uh, Tanner on my mother's side, he sang Danny boy, like no one I'd ever, you know, he had a great voice and, mm. and you know, we've got that uh, English, you know, UK heritage. There's, a, you know, you come from there, you're a mongrel. There's a little bit of Welsh, there's a little bit of Scottish, there's a little bit of Irish, you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, and, to me, you know, whenever I hear Danny Boy, of course, I hear my grandpa's voice and and the story of Danny Boy and, you know, that just the, the the angst of the of the Irish and that they never give up and their and their zest for life. You know, you know, one of my one of my favorite um, Irish jokes is I was working at a conference and this young Irishman, he says, do you want to hear the greatest Irish joke of all time? So I can't pass that up. Right. He says, well, here it is, Boyo. He says, two Irishmen walk past the bar. 
<laughs> it could happen. He says it could happen. It's not likely, but it could happen. You know? and, and, and all those emotions that come in, you know, those are the songs that you say, yeah, I want that on my playlist. And if there's a song in your playlist that doesn't bring some kind of emotion that you're looking for, then, then why did you keep it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. We also like to find out if you like to listen to music while you work. You know, I used to and found that I'm, I'm not a good multitasker. <laughs> so uh, that's when I bring out the seagulls and the waves and stuff. You know? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, calm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, have I have I contemplated my navel lately? Uh, by the way, <laughs> I, I do love calm. We joke, but I you know, I do my meditation oh. every morning. It's, it's brilliant. You know, I know you're going to ask me, where can we find out more about your work, Chester? Where can we buy your books, right? I mean, yeah, I know that's coming. <laughs> that was the next question. Yes. Yeah. Follow us on LinkedIn. I always say us because Adrian Gostick is my brilliant uh, co-author. We've got the Gratitude Journal on LinkedIn. Love you to sign up. We've had over 70,000 people have signed up. It's just a great place to think about, you know, what are we grateful for instead of, you know, what are we lacking? Follow us on LinkedIn, the Gratitude Journal. Our books are available everywhere, you know, uh, Amazon, Books A Million, BookBub, uh, wherever good books are sold, and ChesterElton.com. Over and above that, I would really highly recommend if you've got any kind of anxiety at work, listen to our podcast. We're, we're new podcasters. Uh, I think we've only, uh, we've dropped, I think, our eighth episode today. I think we've had like 2,500 downloads already. It's, 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 it's top of mind for a lot of people. And our, our global community. It's we thrive together dot global. I know you said, oh, that's brilliant. It's globally. No, we couldn't get dot com. That was the only reason. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that works. We, yeah, we thrive together dot global. It's a safe place to talk about wellness and anxiety in the workplace. Do you know in our data, only 10% of employees said they would feel comfortable talking to their boss about their anxiety at work? 10%. Mm. Yeah. You'd think employee, you know, assistance programs would have exploded over COVID. Not at all. Nobody believes it's confidential. This is a safe place to talk to peers, people that have been through and are going through what you're going through. We're very proud of it. We invite you to join. Well, Chester, we'll put all of those links in the show notes. So for people, if you if you missed it here, just check the show notes out. We'll be able to have those up for you. And thank you. This has been a, I don't know if we had a laugh to a word ratio uh, this high on, on a podcast <laughs> ever. So thank you. This has just been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for coming on. You bet. You know, I, I always like to close with the immortal words of my father. And it's just a great way to live. He used to pull me aside and he says, Chess, you be good to everybody. Everybody's having a tough day. I think those are words to live by. He treated people that bagged his groceries the same as captains of industry. And I think particularly with COVID, you know, listen, give people grace, give them a beat, be good to everybody. Everybody's having a tough day. And uh, Tim and Kurt, it was a laugh a minute. Uh, invite me back anytime. This was more fun <laughs> than humans should be allowed. <laughs> it was. It was great. Thank you, Chester. Okay. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Chester, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our gratitude-filled brains. That was just a nice softball, easy one. That was that's a layup. That's a layup. But I'm glad you went there. Unlike your question in the intro about my <laughs> most grateful thing, I went with the easy oh. thing there. Anyway. That was not a softball question, but you <laughs> answered it really, really well. And so thank you for, for doing that. Um, maybe that's kind of a good place to start grooving is how we kind of suck at expressing gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, right? yeah, I think that's the key piece here is right that we think we're doing a good job at it, particularly managers, according to the research that Chester has done, when in reality, eh, eh. We're middling to poor at best. Right. Well, what what was the data he had that uh, something like 70% of managers think they're kind of rocking it, <laughs> but the employees that report to them, only about 23% of them saying, yeah, my manager is actually doing a good job. Kind of a gap. Kind of a little <laughs> gap there, right? right. Oh, my right. gosh. And, and – and this this kind of blindness this this is this is a bias right this is an unconscious blind spot 
for, for managers that they believe that they're doing better than they are and don't have any really very few of them have any source of feedback that says, no, you're actually failing on this. Right. Cause what, what, <laughs> what employee is going to say, excuse me, hello, uh, you know, Ms. Manager, can you make sure that you just let me know how good I'm doing it? You know, on a regular basis. I don't need it all the time, <laughs> but just every now and then just let me know how I'm doing. Maybe up to 13 times a day. You could just do that every, every single day. I think that that was an interesting piece of, of data that he brought in that Gallup survey that said we max out on our gratitude after 13, which seems like a lot to me, but yet, I think about the different ways that we can express gratitude, and I think this is important. Gratitude isn't this big, overly production piece. And I think that's the key piece that I'm, one of the key pieces that I'm taking away from this. Gratitude is really just showing your appreciation for the work that the people around you are doing. That can be as simple as gosh, you know, you helped me out with, you know, the intro, Tim, and I was struggling getting through that and you just made it okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know? Wow. That, that sounded sincere. Thank you. <laughs> it was sincere. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Just joking. <laughs> Come on. You know, I, I mean, there are well, times I, when I'm insincere <laughs> with you, but you know, that, that one was, that was, that was good. I had a conversation with a, a woman who has a pretty high level job at a fortune 500 con- company recently. And she was saying that she's moving into a new job and how she really wants to make sure that she's got support to be successful in this job. And as we talked about it, she she said, wait a minute. She said, you know, I don't really want support. You know, she's a pro. She's been at her job for some time. She said, what I want is recognition that I'm either on track or not on track. Yes. She said, I'm okay with with hearing that hey, maybe a better way to do this or give give more consideration to this when you're making those kinds of decisions. She said, that's okay, but let me know if I'm on the right track. Give me some recognition. And I, I thought, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, Mm-mm. right? You know, we've got to, we've got to have recognition from everywhere from the from the person who starts today to the person who is who is basically getting ready to retire we need to recognize them and the manager i got i have to riff on this the manager that is in caught in that box of ah that's their job they just got to get up and do it suck it up put on your big boy pants you know what wake up and smell the coffee you know this <laughs> is the 21st friggin century and we can't have companies choosing to basically ignore their employees because those companies are going to, uh, unless those companies want to suffer because employees yeah. are going to choose to work somewhere else. I guess that that's my thought. Your story about the manager at that fortune 500 company, I think is really illuminating because it's one of the factors that I think gratitude and recognition do is they reduce uncertainty. And uncertainty in our brains is one of those things that we ruminate over. And it's the factor that leads to stress and it leads to all of these other negative pieces. And when we express recognition or gratitude, what we're really doing is we're reducing some of that uncertainty because we're saying you are doing the right thing. You are no longer on this path that I am I going down the right path? Am I not going down the right path? You have been recognized and you have been acknowledged for being on the right path and doing the right types of things. And that is really, not only does it show that the manager cares, but it is giving that person who is receiving that gratitude or that recognition a point that says, you're doing the right things, keep doing those right things and remove some of that uncertainty from their lives. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. There's also something that I'm not exactly sure how to articulate, but also heard a story from a, a woman whose parents kind of have this issue about cleaning the house. The mom Mm. always cleans the house. The dad never cleans the house. And the mom gets kind of bitter about it. So then- This sounds like Chester's (laughs) story. (laughs) Anyway, keep going. Then on her birthday, the dad says, well, I'm going to give you a house cleaning service. And it just pisses the mom off even more because in some ways, like she's being recognized, like the dad's thinking, I'm recognizing- you know, and expressing gratitude that says she cleans the house all the time. So I'm going to alleviate that burden from her with a house cleaning service. But what she's what she's missing is the fact that he's really in the boat, right? Yeah. That it's a of kind of a disingenuous recognition 
what she's really looking for is to be recognized by him getting in and helping clean the house. Which is different than what Chester was talking about. Like he said, you know, they've been in their marriage long enough where all they, they, the expressions of love are through these acts. And he said, you know, one of the acts that I know is if I clean the kitchen up or I clean the house up for her as throughout the day or throughout throughout the week or whatever it would be. When she comes down to the kitchen and it's clean. Yeah. That's an act of love. And that's, I thought that was an interesting way of putting it is that, you know, the way that we express gratitude isn't always just with words. It is through actions sometimes. Right. And that I think is a really keen insight. And to your point, buying a cleaning service is not the same as you doing the work in cleaning. You're not putting any effort in. It's the cheap way out, even though it's costing you money, because you're not investing any of your own energy, time, element that says, if I'm that wife, I go, I know you don't like doing this, but the only reason you're doing it is for me. And that makes it that much more special. Yeah. And I think that's, that's like, that's a key piece here. And I wonder as a manager, as we're thinking about people out there in the workforce, you know, how are you cleaning the house for your employees? What, what is it that you're doing that is giving them that sense of appreciation that they're valued and that you understand what they're going through on a day in and day out basis. Well, this reminds me of a study that was done. It's part of the Ikea effect. Dan Ariel used it to explain the Ikea effect. But in one condition, the participants worked hard on a project to do an analysis and then a recommendation. And in one condition, they present and all the teams are competing and the company chooses to move forward with a recommendation. In the other situation, the teams present and there's a thank you for presenting, but they are also told, we're not going to do anything with these recommendations. With any of the recommendations. With any of the recommendations. We're just, we're not going to move forward at all. And people who got that generic thank you for working on it, and and of course, we're not going to do anything, felt really bad about it. And I think in part, right, and and this is central to the IKEA effect, but I think it also speaks to gratitude because they didn't go in and say, what we liked about your story was your recommendations were this and this and this. There was that lacked specificity and authenticity. It was just thanks for presenting and we're and we're done. We're not going to do anything with with these uh, recommendations. And I wonder how people would respond if there was an authentic response to the story to the presentation. Yeah, it, it, it's it's the idea of giving them, you know, hey, thank you for all of your cleaning for the entire year. I'm not going to clean the house, but here's a here's a gift certificate for a house cleaner, right? It makes you feel worse than right. almost right. like but if they had gone in and to your point, it'd be interesting to see the difference if there was an authentic like if you had another condition in there. If you had the condition of you know, we really liked your presentation. Here were the five points that we appreciated. Yeah, you brought right. in this fantastic aspect of this, but we're sorry we're not moving forward with anything at this time. And and the feeling afterwards, I think I'm hypothesizing would be vastly different. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that's important to to think about if you're a manager or even if you're just a, you know, anybody within an organization is what is the type of feedback that you give? And this goes back into another thing that Chester talked about. And I loved his story about it with his son, where with the pictures and the various different aspects that he was talking about and how his son was like, oh yeah, thanks. You're going to tell me that's a great picture again. And it wasn't until they stopped and said, tell me about this. Tell me about this picture. That then the son became engaged With that. And I think there are opportunities within organizations for that same thing to happen. If, again, and in this example, if you would have asked that team to say, so what do you think are the the strong points of this? How were you thinking about this? What was going on? And in that conversation, you're providing feedback and saying, that's a great way of thinking about this. I really appreciate the thought process that went into this. Or, you know, you really worked hard at 
pulling that type of information in, which is right. unique. And I think that's really wonderful. That's a different feel. It's just a whole different area. And isn't that authenticity, recognizing that from an authentic perspective, part of psychological safety? Isn't there an element of that that says, oh, I can trust you now because you're actually taking time to invest in me, right? There's a sense of it's reciprocity and trust. Yeah, I love this idea too. When Chester said this idea that it had to, if if there was malice involved in anything, that was a huge thing. And it reminded me of our conversation with John Levy, where he was talking about benevolence as one of those key factors of of trust, right? The the three different types of trust that he was talking about. And benevolence was one of them. And that was the one that if you broke, you just lost all of your trust. And I thought that matched up really nicely with malice, a very similar concept uh, on this. And I just think, again, trust is so vital to, you know, in John Levy's thing about getting influence and, and building these relationships with people, which is exactly the same thing that is vital from a leadership perspective within an organization and your team and building up that relationships and the trust that you have with the people on your team. I just thought that was fantastic. So it really was. Uh, Anything else you want to cover in our grooving session here, Kurt? You know, the only thing, and I just thought uh, when Chester brought up the story again, wonderful storyteller about the Toronto FC, the the soccer team and the new manager and the way that the manager put together that recognition program that he did where he has randomly picked people, but those people then chose who got the gift card and recognized other people for what they did. And I just thought that is brilliant because you're bringing in this aspect of a you're recognizing people, but you're recognizing them from others, which is a very authentic piece but it's a, both building gratitude for the company, but also for those two individuals that are going in there. And I was wondering if there's other ways of being able to do this just beyond having a random aspect of it. So in other words, could you set up a recognition program or a incentive program even where you win and you may get something, but you also get part of that is to give to somebody else? I love that, yeah. So that it, it becomes this element of saying, you know, I won this, but I wouldn't have been able to do this without the support of these people that are in in the organization. And that could be anybody. And it could be from, you know, the the front desk person to the clerk to the accountants to whoever that would be. It could be a teammate on their team. But just having that ability to then pass it on, I think is really cool. It would be a great use of non-monetary rewards too. I think that you the closer you get to money in that situation, yeah. the more awkward it could be. So the the farther away it is from the dollar sign would probably be be more effective. I think that that could be cool though. I would love to, you know, if anybody out there is listening and you want to explore that, you should reach out to Tim or me because I think we would have a fantastic opportunity in our hands and really drive some fantastic results. So uh, that's just my hypothesis, but we need a company to try it out. There you go. I love that. So folks, hang on. Uh, We're going to be back in just a minute. Kurt is going to read our bonus track. Hello, everyone. This is Kurt with your bonus track and groove idea for the week. Our conversation with Chester was one that I smiled throughout the entire time we were talking. You can feel the joy radiating off of Chester, and he lives these values that he talks about. Our conversation focused on gratitude, specifically focusing on how we need to do more of it. This is very true in organizations as well as our life. Managers often feel like they are doing a good job, but that feeling isn't what employees felt. There is a gratitude gap between what managers do and what employees want. Chester talked about how managers may feel afraid that they are giving out too much gratitude, but research by Gallup shows that showing gratitude or thanks doesn't lose its effectiveness until after 13 times or so. We can all do more. We need to be specific on that gratitude as well, not broad generalizations. 
We can also make that easier by asking people about the work that they are doing. This is a form of gratitude in a certain sense. Finally, anxiety at work is a big issue and we need to be aware of it and account for it. And we will have another episode of Behavioral Grooves with Chester specifically talking about that issue coming up in a future episode. So now for the groove idea. This is easy. Express some gratitude. Find something to be grateful for and let that person know that you are grateful for whatever it is that they did. You might even try telling them 13 times. I'm going to let my family know how grateful I am for them particularly my kids. So give us a shout out. Let us know what gratitude you're expressing and how that goes. We would love to hear from you. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode and are grateful for you who have listened all the way through to the end. Not sure how many people actually do that. So for you who is listening to this right now, I am extremely grateful for you. So with that, go out and find your groove this week.